Hello, everyone. I'm Maikiko James, Director of Programs for WIF, and I'm speaking today with Anne Alvarez, Director and Beth Levison, Producer of The Martha Mitchell Effect, and Kartiki Gonzalez, Director and Gunit Monga, Producer for The Elephant Whisperers. Both are documentary films that can be viewed now on Netflix, and I'm so excited to have this conversation with you all today. Um, so the title of this panel is Netflix Shorts, and the films do have similar run times of around 40 minutes, but in my opinion, they have a number of other things in common, such as the depth and emotional gravity carried by your subject matters and conveyed so effectively in that time frame, and are also stories that need to be far more visible in the culture today. Both of these films, while, you know, focusing on different kinds of subjects, I think are need to be widely seen. Um, so I wanted to start with each of you as pairs to tell us a little bit about the genesis of these projects and how you came to them. Uh, Anne and Beth, why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so uh, my co-director, Deborah McClutchy, and I uh, sort of heard about Martha originally from a podcast um, a few years back, around 2019. And, you know, we were fresh off of, uh, or in the middle, actually, of, of Trump's uh, presidency and really wanted to tell a female-driven story. Um, heard about Martha, couldn't believe that we hadn't heard about her in the history books and uh, did some more digging, realized that she was this kind of amazing, telegenic, you know, very charismatic character in Watergate. And that uh, there was a larger story here of why she wasn't known in the history books, that she was essentially gaslit uh, by the powers that be. And uh, we just started digging more and really wanted to tell this story through her own voice to sort of restore um, her agency and, and let her tell her own story that had been lost to history for 50 years. Yeah, and I guess I came to the project, uh, Anne and Deb had shared an early proposal and reel with me and I loved the project, but I didn't have capacity and I really wanted to work on it. And so I said, I love this project. I think it's amazing if, you know, go, go your own way. And, but if you need support or in three or four or five months, just come back to me and things might be better. And I'm really happy that they didn't get traction. And then they came back. And at the same time, I think they were talking to Judith. And so Judith Mitzraki and I came on as a producing team. And, um, and that was really wonderful. And I guess I would just say I was so fascinated by the project also because I'd never heard anything about Martha Mitchell. And um, I didn't have a great uh, education in American history. And, you know, I, I had learned a little about a little bit about Watergate on my own, but just had never heard of her. And certainly in the popular culture, it was always all the president's men. And I love these opportunities to tell stories that haven't been told or that have been overlooked, uh, especially when they're about women. And so, um, you know, I came on board and never looked back. And it's just a, an important and a timely story, even if it's 50 years old. And Anne, you mentioned the burying of the story, many of us never having heard of Martha until very recently. Did you, what did you learn in that process? How, in addition to the gaslighting, you know, how was the story suppressed and, and what do you think actually brought it to light in, in these recent years? If you want to speak about the podcast or any other facts you learned in that process of research? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think we're at a period where we're looking back um, at history through a female lens on a variety of levels. I think we're also at a place where there's more of a public acceptance to listen to, to women's stories, probably because there's more women telling these stories, you know? But I also think, you know, um, there's many facets of women as there's many facets of everybody, but there's, a, I think, a greater acceptance to, um, to dig into these complicated and flawed characters. And, and Martha's definitely that. Um, so we wanted to, you know, kind of reframe her um, for an audience. And, and she was also incredibly modern, you know? There aren't that, many women, certainly any cabinet wives that we can think of now that are like her. I mean, there aren't that many people who cross party lines to speak truth to power. So uh, even though she was a, a figure of history, she is a very modern character and we wish there were more people like Martha today. If I can share something which I think is great for this panel actually, um, just yesterday I was listening to a podcast with Salman Rushdie 
and um, he was talking uh, with David Remnick. It was a New Yorker podcast. And Rushdie said, he referenced one of his mentors who said that history should not be written until people's voices can be heard. And I loved that quote. And I think there was something about now was a time where we actually could tell her story. I think that Ann and Deb did this incredible job mining the archives and really found all this stuff. And I think people were willing to kind of unearth her and maybe we're seeing her in a different way. So sometimes as after I heard that, I wondered, could could this story have actually been done 10 years ago or was the time now to, to tell this story? Absolutely. Yeah, there's, I mean, unfortunately, a timeliness more than ever as we're thinking about our current place in history and things getting rolled back, things that we absolutely need to be protecting. But even the, you know, cultural attention to gaslighting, I think, is something that, you know, we always have to remain vigilant about and understand that's a real thing that happens and affects all of our societies. So thank you so much for telling this story. Um, Kartiki and Kuni, tell us about how the Elephant Whisperer came about. In simple words, it all began by me falling in love with Raghu. He was this tiny little elephant. And I was I actually came across him on, while I was driving on my way from Uti back to Bangalore to shift my things back. And I saw Bowman and him for the first time. And here, here was this tiny three-month calf that was waddling behind, behind Bowman. And I was hanging out the car, which I shouldn't have been doing. But then he, he noticed how interested I was. And he sort of beckoned to me to come over. So, so I went, I, I pulled my car over to the left and I jumped out and I went and joined them. And we went down uh, to the river nearby where he got in the water. He was going down for his, like for his evening bath. So we splashed around in the water a bit. I was able to scrub him. And I really, oh, I, I think over the course of that, the, the time that I spent there, I really realized that, that Bowman and Raghu had this really special bond. And here you had this orphan calf and you had this human who was, who was literally everything to the elephant calf. And that really hit me about this, this beautiful special bond that they that man and animal have always shared all the time. And I think what really happened back then was at that stage, I was, I was really, uh, I mean, we, we were going through an entire uh, section of climate change. So by, by Raghu being orphaned, it really had this kind of bittersweet beginning to the story because the Asian elephant in India is actually losing its habitat at a really rapid pace due to encroachment and climate change in a country like India, which is developing extremely rapidly. And I think that that sort of brings out the background question that the Asian elephant is actually in danger today with only about 35,000 to 40,000 elephants left. And it being an animal that's so revered in a country like India, it was really heartbreaking to see more and more calves come in. Raghu's mother was initially electrocuted as they, her entire herd had wandered into a nearby village when they were looking for food and water. And this was during a really prolonged drought that was in the space that I call home. And I, I, I actually grew up in the same space. So this is a place that I have been visiting ever since I was three years old. So it was just depressing to see this all happening. So I just wanted people to really be able to understand elephants on a much deeper level and to recognize all the similar traits that they share with us. And I think that I really wanted the audience to be able to uh, to relate, uh, yeah, I, I think to relate to elephants and to get to understand them better in order to help protect them. I also wanted to really look at uh, giving Bowman and Belly who are from this indigenous community in the South of India, and there are only 1,700 of them left uh, in today's world. I wanted to showcase the beauty of the way that they live, the way they share their time and space with animals in this beautiful space and coexist so beautifully. That's one, that's one thing that I really wanted to focus on. And I think coexistence is a powerful way to go forward into the future. So that I think that's how this entire story came uh, came to me and how I met this tiny little elephant calf. It was just a very special moment. And uh, for me, um, <clears throat> uh, Karthiki discovered this story, found this story and made a, made a reel um, 
And I saw that and came on board as a producer. Uh, I was just thrilled to see her voice, her very strong visual sense. And uh, uh, I, and that was around three and a half years ago. And uh, I was very happy to be, you know, in a place where I could champion Kartiki and her work. This is Kartiki's debut film. And uh, for me, it's really important to push as a producer to be able to push more and more women in uh, film and in behind the scenes, and especially as directors. So it almost like fit into my life's mission. I was like, and and it was gorgeous, gorgeous piece of work uh, with Raghu and Amu and their story that uh, we were able to follow uh, as Verity. So yeah, so for me, it has been the one one of the most magical experiences being part of this sacred bond. Thank you both. And Karthiki, I'm curious, I mean, it's so fascinating getting a glimpse into this world and for Bowman and Belly specifically as, you know, preservers and protectors of nature and the planet, but also the tension towards the end of the film, the things that they don't have control over. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, the dynamics of how they do their work um, and, you know, what is it in, in terms of th that they do have power over? It seems that they get calves, you know, when they are sent to them, uh, but how, how can they, you know, continue to preserve and how can we support what they're doing? Uh, so basically, uh, uh, you have Bowman Belly and they live in this, in the core area of, of the, the Mudumalai Tiger Reserve, which is a part of a much larger space called the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve, which is three, three states in India and covers about nine national reserves stitched together. And that's why it's the largest contiguous space for the Asian elephants. And we have the we have about twenty indigenous communities which are living in the core area of these of these forests. So they've always been working alongside animals and also doing things like honey harvesting because a, a lot of the basis of these tribes has always been hunter gatherers. So it it's I I think there's this beautiful synergy of the forest department working alongside these indigenous communities, which is also enabling them. To, to earn money and to also work. And I think that's really special that they're working together because you have the indigenous people who have all this ancient knowledge and connection to all the animals. And then you have the scientists and you have the forest department who are helping with, with the labor part of it of having the anti-poaching uh, watches and so on. And also looking after the forests and protecting them. So I think it's just a beautiful space where everything is actually working together. And we do have a lot of problems in the space. There's a whole lot of human animal conflict because these are people who are literally living on the periphery of the forest, which enables a lot of danger because you have elephants crossing into your yards all the time, eating a year worth of crops for independent farmers. So that just, it actually puts a bigger problem onto the table. How do people and animals coexist on such a deeper level? And this is actually something that, is has been going on for quite some time. The the camp where uh, Amo and Ragu and Bowman and Belly are at is it it's called Tepakadu Elephant Camp. And the camp was initially started about 140 years ago. It's one of the oldest in all of Asia, and it was started by the British uh, as as a timber camp, which has now become an animal rehabilitation camp at the moment. So at this point, I think the main message from the documentary is more to get people to understand animals and to also focus on the relationship that we share. It wasn't so much about trying to support the elephants in any way. It was more about a message to humanity. Thank you for that. I think, again, similar to um, thinking about these two films juxtaposed together, there, these messages are you know, they're they're encompassing, right? They're really things we have to think about in terms of our existence right now, our coexistence right now. And what does it mean to be in relation to each other across genders with the planet, with animals, um, you know, deep, <laughs> deep imperative questions that we're asking ourselves. Um, I wanted to turn to both of you, um, to both teams about production and how long these films took, um, you know, from pre into finally getting the distribution. And then also, what did you learn in the process? We are WIF and so a lot of our audience are filmmakers. Were there any particulars of these journeys in terms of like your past filmmaking that you thought were departures um, or insights that you can share in terms of making films, particularly of this length? So, um, Anne, why don't we start with you? 
Um, as I said, you know, we sort of came up with the idea in 2019. Um, there was a lot of development accruing archival, trying to figure out if this was a short or a, a feature. Um, and then Beth and Judith came on board in 2020 and really were able to, um, to package this um, as something that we could uh, get a pre-sale. Uh, from and, we, and it was really important that we do that because we needed to pay them, but also to pay for all the archival and just moving forward. Um, so I think that was in the spring of 2021. So really, the so then we just started editing and it went pretty fast and we premiered in uh, January 2022 at Sundance. Um, and what we learned... Um, you know, I think it was, uh, I learned a lot about um, uh, about producing, working with Beth Levison and and Judith Miharahi. I mean, they were both great. And um, I, I, I have such um, an amount of uh, gratitude and pride um, working with them and working with the team of four of uh, women. It was, it was so great. And um, there was so much support. Um, I don't know, I, I, you know, I've, I've worked as an editor by day. Um, uh, for many years, and I don't necessarily get as much support, so it was really nice to have that that team effort, and I think that's, um, it, it went really well. I thought it was quite smooth. Yeah, I guess for me, I would say, yeah, I mean, I've been producing films for a while now. Um, what I loved was having a producing partner, and it's a very isolating role, and it can be difficult and you have to make difficult decisions that many, that audiences often don't see or realize had to have been made. So to have a partner in making some decisions is really wonderful. So I really love that. And I think um, it was just so great to make a short. I think so many uh, filmmakers feel compelled to make full length films that only full full make full length films are legitimate, maybe. And, you know, I think it was just really exciting when we made that turn and decided to make a short and that we could tell a deep and rich and relevant story, you know, in those 40 minutes. Um, and, you know, and not spend, you know, two, three, four, five years making a film, which is not unusual. So um, yeah, so it was a great experience and, um, and where we are now, you know, well, there's lots of learning in this whole thing all the time about the market and where things are going and, and all that stuff. So it's been great and a great ride. Gani, do you want to share your experience? Sure. Um, it, uh, I mean, I had, um, an absolute blast working with Kartiki. Uh, it was, it's always been a very good conversation, great collaboration. Uh, I, like I said, love her visual sense. And for me, it was the first time to be on a journey of, um, of a wildlife documentary I've been producing for 15 plus years. Um, and, uh, to be on this, to see real, uh, and, and to see, you know, and to witness Kartiki's connection with Raku, with Amo and with the, with the community, and to be uh, and to be able to support her in every way on this journey um, just meant a lot to me. And uh, and we had just and we had uh, Netflix come up early, and they were uh, an absolute backbone for our journey and uh, and a support system, a bouncing board. And we were, you know, been um, and and I and I think we found the best platform for our voice for Netflix. Yeah. And Kaiki, what about you? How is this maybe a departure or similar to other producing experience or directing experiences that you had? Uh, this is actually uh, my debut documentary. So I haven't made any before this, but this goes back to 2017 when I first started out this project. And I think Netflix came on board in 2020 and Guneet, and it's just been amazing with all the support that they've offered in bringing this and taking it to the rest of the world. And I think we we did have a couple of things that I learned along the way because I think there are a whole lot of documentaries that come from the past or archival. And then this one, it was really interesting because we were on ground while we were, I mean, while it was unraveling in front of us. And I think that was 
it was interesting because it was so hard to not get emotionally invested into the many things that were happening on the ground. And we were just merely spectators at the point. And I think we had a whole bunch of challenges that were being up close and personal with tigers, leopards, wild elephants. And we, we, shot, we shot this over five years. So we basically documented day in and day out, out of this period of time. And we had about 450 hours of footage that we were sitting on. And right from the very beginning, the one thing that I really wanted to do is to bring out the sacred bond between man and animal. And that was what really got us through because we had 450 hours of, we had a little bit of human animal conflict. We had scientists talking, we had natural history. We were out in the wilderness, actually filming tigers and elephants and the ecosystem as well. So it was really hard to be able to come down to 40 minutes and to really keep to the core idea, which was the sacred bond. And I think that that cinema really can become more inclusive in many ways. And I wanted to really attract more people who've not had a voice before and to showcase images of our natural world and our connection. And I really just learned, I think one of the biggest things that I really learned was that storytelling is really at the heart of human existence. It, it can be powerful and change the way our brains work and our hearts and bring us closer to one another. And I think that's such a powerful tool to unite different communities and species and share the beauty of our natural world. And, and Guneet's been amazing. And it's just really great that I've had this constant support and since I'm really new in, into this entire space. So it's been, it's been really exciting and a big learning curve. Truly, yeah, I think the editing, I imagine for both of these projects is a, a Herculean task, but you did it very well. They're very powerful, even in their short frame. And, and you know, arguably there's, you know, reason now to have formats and lengths of all kinds and and audiences are so different so um and speaking of which i'd love to ask each of you you know how are you viewing you know the dark documentary landscape in this moment are you excited for where it's going i think in my time i come from an impact producing background and it's changed so much in the last decade and as makers of these of these kinds of projects are you excited or hope and hopeful what are you seeing that's changing and then obviously we're are the challenges um, that that we're up against as we you know continue to move through this rapidly changing industry um, and anyone can start I think um, I mean I come from India uh, Kartiki and I come from India and uh, there's definitely amazing filmmakers there's definitely I mean Indian documentary scene in the last few years has really come up at Sundance at Cannes at the Academy with Rintu's work or Shirley's work with Kartiki with you know just it's it's uh, amazing to see the rise of filmmakers from India uh, there's definitely lack of support uh, with the government funds or with uh, um, with with public funds public funding um, there is a, there 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 is platforms like Netflix which have actually given a voice to us and and made something like this happened and nurtured us with the film over the years. So uh, while that is very exciting, I've had a run with Netflix with period end of sentence where I was an EP uh, in 2019. So definitely there are these gorgeous, amazing stories to be told from India. And uh, while the time is right, there are filmmakers, there are challenges with funding. There are challenges with the years that it takes to put together a documentary. But um, uh, but but yes, with with uh, the emergence of digital platforms, uh, there is support. There's definitely support, but we can do a lot more in, in from where from the place where we come in. It's an exciting time for sure. Well, um, I love that. Uh, I'll add on. Sanguine. Oh, sorry, you go, Kartiki. No, no, just one small sentence. No, I was I was just from everything that I have seen, I think in the past it's uh it's been sort of the parachute sort of filmmaking where people have been coming from outside into india and telling stories from the country but i think that we actually live in a space now where we have so many stories but where i i think as guneet mentioned the funding is is really hard and i really hope that that this being on a global scale really just helps other other filmmakers to come out with their work 
to put their stories out in the world because the elephant whispers is such a tiny film from a very small place and this indigenous community that's really gone out to the world so i just hope that this really opens doors to to other filmmakers to come out with small unique stories from any part of the planet and it's just really lovely to also have a space to to have locally made films go out from india i think that's really important in allowing us and our country to have a voice I guess I would just say I really appreciate that perspective and and how sanguine you are. I this is something I think about all the time. I think the market is really changing and the landscape is really changing. And we've had lots of streamers uh, reduce the amount of content that they're creating. And you know, some streamers or some divisions have gone away that we're supporting documentaries and we're really seeing the commodification of content and the commercialization of the documentary form. Um, so I think that there's so many films that are being made that aren't necessarily finding their way to audiences or really are experiencing great challenges and getting the funding that they need or the support and finding their way to viewers. So, you know, I think it's a very challenging time. Um, and I think it's a challenging time for any filmmakers who are on the margins as well. And, um, and that includes women. And uh, so I think about this all the time and I'm, I'm hopeful and we just have to find new ways. And I think one of the ways is working together and not necessarily competing as much, but we need the industry to also work with us to make sure that especially independents don't get lost in the mix. So it's an interesting time, very uncertain, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would just echo what everyone else is saying here and that, you know, it is exciting to see more streamers and then, you know, certainly in the digital platform and, and women involved in filmmaking, telling women's stories. I think that's the most exciting, you know, representation is, is more valued now, uh, but we also see studios closing, right, left and right, and we're not seeing as many women honored, right? There were no women um, directors that were nominated this year for the Oscars. So I, you know, I think it's, um, I think funding is always going to be challenging and obviously, um, minority filmmakers, independent filmmakers are the ones that are going to suffer. So, um, but you know, it's always been challenging to make a documentary film. I mean, I'm not sure if there were ever a time there wasn't, unless you live in Canada. I don't know. It's just the, it's the landscape in the United States. <laughs> Yeah, could you imagine if we had the resources available to us? Oh my God, I, I was sitting next to um, a uh, an animated short filmmaker who gets their funding from the National you know, Film Board of Canada. And I was like, how do I get funding to be in Canada? Do I need to divorce my husband and marry a Canadian? She's like, yes, that's how you do it. <laughs> it's an option. Yeah, but then you get much shorter editing weeks. You don't get as much time to edit in Canada. So there's a trade-off. Okay, there's always a trade-off. <laughs> well, we only have a, about a minute left. I'd love to ask each of you for new filmmakers or filmmakers who are interested in, in entering the doc space, you know, what would be one practical tip or, or suggestion or even resource that you might suggest? Um, and they can be international, they can be domestic. Um, but what would you what where would you point new filmmakers to go if they're as they're starting out their journey? Um, I'm a co-founder of the Documentary Producers Alliance, and we advocate on behalf of producers toward the health and welfare of the documentary field as a whole. We are really committed to emerging producers and producers of all experiences, level of experiences, wherever you are in the world. So um, we do a lot of educational work. So I would encourage folks to check out what we're doing. Um, I think the producing skills are really so essential. Um, in this landscape that is difficult and knowing how to navigate and seek funding and build relationships and find partners. So um, yeah, so I would, I, I'm making a plug for the Documentary Producers Alliance. And I would also just say like my other piece of advice is find someone you trust, find someone that you can work with. It's very hard to do this alone and it is isolating and it's a, it's a complex craft and business so yes find find your community i think that's very important 
Yeah, I would, I would absolutely echo that, you know, find a peer group of people that you like, that you love to collaborate with. This is a collaborative medium. Um, you know, I, I, I will say from my own experience, I found that at, in grad school, but you do not need to go to school. You just find a group of people that, that share your similar ideas and style and, and desires and also find a mentor. I think, I mean, I've had a, a great, great editing mentors um, in, in my field and have really helped me in my career as, as an editor. And um, I mean, those are the people that are going to teach you and share with you, you know, their knowledge and their ideas. And it's, it's, it's just a wonderful thing. Yeah, I would just say, um, you know, uh, definitely um, start by knowing about various fundings that are available. Um, um, what is the kind of development funding and editing and just, you know, um, to basically even firstly step one to absolutely new people to go and attend documentary film festivals and get knowledge about um, the field about the kind of you know just those conversations help you build a camaraderie very early stages and uh, and know more about the kind of support that globally is available given that you can be from any country uh, be it you know sundance or hot dogs or just you know where you can experience that that would be step one then of course i think finding your tribe finding mentors having conversations sharing information is really important because we are so few around the world and it is so hard and it takes so such a long time so sharing and doubling down on each other championing each other i think as it is at the core of it because that's the least we can do you know uh, I feel uh, as we go along, because this is this is just following your passion for so long and putting an important piece of story out there. So I think doubling down uh, when you find your tribe, double down on them. And I would say that everyone's pretty much covered all of this. And I am one of those examples who started out independently and it was a struggle. I was all alone. And then I found Netflix and Guneet, which led me to Doug. And I had mentors on this and it's really gone out in a whole different way. And I think I'm a perfect example of what everyone just spoke about, being able to have the mentor and have the support system. And I would say the number one thing is to really believe in that project. I didn't see this being six years of my life. So to really be there and share that passion right through I think is very very crucial and to believe that it can go places because I started out completely independently no contacts no idea first documentary didn't find a woman wildlife director as well I was stuck basically at that point but I just believed in the story so much that and I think that's why all of this happened well, thank you all so much. Those are excellent pragmatic ideas for people starting out. Build your tribe, join WIF if you haven't already. Um, thank you to Netflix, The Martha Mitchell Effect and The Elephant Whisperers are currently streaming on Netflix. Watch them now if you haven't already. Um, we're so grateful to all of you for your time and look forward to all of the future projects to come. We'll see you soon. Bye.